Um, thank you for coming. I'm Ricardo Gasparetto, and uh, I work for uh, Vodafone Group uh, in the network architecture team. With me is Tom Kivlin. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, morning, still. Uh, Tom Kivlin, principal cloud architect, same team as Ricardo. So uh, today we're going to go. We're going to give you a presentation on uh, um, the lessons we learned from uh, deploying Kubernetes for 5G. I'll give you some brief context introduction. Um, so Vodafone as many, many, many telcos here, I'm sure, uh, is modernizing the network, obviously. We're launching 5G core for 5G standalone in a number of markets. Uh, we just went live, actually, with the first few CNFs uh, in UK, in Romania, many other uh, markets are in the pipeline. So we're well underway. And uh, we're obviously using Kubernetes, here we are, to support and manage these new uh, network functions, all network functions. Um, are coming containerized. Uh, we are then building a telco cloud, Kubernetes-based telco cloud, and it hasn't uh, proven as straightforward as we hoped, as uh, um, it would be, we hope, what Nila IT-like platforms would be. We have added a number of telco-specific features, uh, and we had to tackle some novel issues that uh, were specific uh, to, to network functions. I will go through a couple of these and give you some examples uh, of the more important ones in a minute. But um, so uh, how are we doing it? Uh, um, this is uh, um, a new, we had to reorganize, restructure how we, our business uh, does things and how our teams collaborate with each other a bit, but also how we ourselves in the architecture team do work. So for example, among many things, we are treating the uh, documentation, we're documenting our designs and blueprint uh, uh, with a central blueprint as a single source of truth, for example. So um, these architecture and design documents, uh, as Josh was mentioning uh, um, about uh, low-level designs as code, we also treat blueprints as code, which means obviously using uh, software development techniques uh, to release blueprints more frequently, to uh, track the changes, to collect issues from all of our stakeholders uh, across uh, markets teams, engineering, vendors even. And then uh, we're also contributing um, to an open source telco cloud blueprint. Uh, I'm the work stream lead of Anuket uh, RA2, which is uh, the open source version of, uh, of that design. Uh, that's, uh, um, uh, everybody is obviously welcome to uh, check it out and, uh, um, and contribute, if you will. The, um, uh, RA2 specifically is the project I'm looking at, which is the Kubernetes-based uh, reference architecture. You will see a lot of uh, design decisions, gotchas, uh, insights uh, in that. But there's also an OpenStack-based uh, pro project uh, in parallel. And then uh, um, other Anoket has many, many other uh, software and specification projects as well. And then uh, uh, back to Vodafone, what we have done is also create a central onboarding process so that we can uh, um, for our vendors and their CNFs, so that we can establish uh, the cloud nativeness and the compatibility of, of the software that we're onboarding uh, into our platform with, uh, of course, the features and specifics of our environments. Um, we're ensuring that uh, they are, the CNFs are designed and dimensioned using cloud native principles. And then we also define many, much, much uh, more importantly, the life cycle management of the CNFs. So uh, treating the CNFs uh, obviously as cattle, not pets, uh, uh, means that the automation of the life cycle of the CNFs has to work straight away. Um, things like obviously instantiation, instantiation and configuring a network function are the basics, uh, but things like uh, upgrades um, take a lot of, take a lot of, are taking a lot of, of our time recently and then uh, things like scaling uh, resiliency to um, cluster operations and so on. But uh, let me show you just a, a few examples of the things we learned. Um, I'll give you, okay, this is a simplified overview of uh, a Kubernetes-based uh, telco cloud platform. Um, I'll give you an overview of uh, um, maybe two main areas that we have been working on in the past few months, years. Um, 
one being multi-tenancy and network multi-homing. These are tightly related. And then the standardization of a catalog for things like node profiles, uh, add-ons, uh, among other things. So uh, I'll start with this one. So to avoid the sprawl of um, custom node sizing, custom cluster configurations, um, we've come up uh, with a set of standardized um, node profiles and configurations. Um, you will see some of these uh, uh, actually feeding through, for example, also in Inokit. Uh, the environment in Vodafone, as you will imagine, is very uh, diverse. There's multiple tenants, multiple vendors, multiple markets doing different things. So ensuring uh, things like segregation, multi-tenancy, uh, and controls with, within a secure telco cloud uh, is something uh, uh, of critical importance for us. So things like uh, um, diverse and different uh, and custom designs, that sort of thing we're trying to limit with, uh, for example, two main profiles uh, for basic and network intensive nodes, supporting obviously control and signal and playing versus data playing applications, for example. And uh, then these uh, are then declined into multiple flavors. For example, with and without hyperthreading, we see that hyperthreading is uh, uh, very beneficial to some of our uh, both control and data plane uh, functions. So uh, enabling that or not is quite important. And then obviously for network intensive application, the types of acceleration, for example, are we using virtual switches? Are we using SRAOV? What uh, exactly can the application expect from the, from the platform is then built into the catalog this way. Um, then the other uh, thing I wanted to uh, highlight um, is obviously that uh, we have multi -network, multiple networks, multi VRF environments where we have requirements uh, for, uh, to, con to connect our network functions and therefore the cluster where they're hosted to uh, different systems uh, that are located in different parts of the network. So that uh, is obviously a, a very common requirement. Uh, sometimes this is solved uh, uh, with a single network interface, especially when network functions don't support uh, multiplexing. So with external routing and then uh, obviously a single network interface, uh, we, can, uh, we can have, you can use the native vanilla Kubernetes networking model to then connect uh, uh, pods to, to an external routing object. That obviously let us use the Kubernetes uh, uh, techniques, policies, uh, but obviously we had the, pre we had the firewalling, the external firewalling, the external uh, problem that, that was mentioned before. There's no such thing as a, let's say, advanced uh, egress IP um, in the uh, vanilla, let's say, Kubernetes distributions. So obviously that uh, is forcing us to segregate applications that don't support uh, multi-homing into dedicated clusters, adding to the overhead. Otherwise, uh, the other way to solve things would be to have multiple network interfaces, such as here. You see that there's different networks connected to different interfaces, but that comes with its own set of problems, such as the fact that these networks are not treated as first-class citizens. We can't apply network policies, we can't do services on them, we can't do what we would like to do with the, uh, let's say, first class citizen objects uh, of Kubernetes. So uh, Tom will talk about the multi-networking uh, object um, enhancement proposal in a minute, but um, yeah, this is something that we are actively working on and we hope to work on uh, uh, with, with the community. Um, other things uh, I haven't mentioned uh, include, uh, for example, management of external networking and so on. But um, I, I will, uh, uh, yeah, I will take any questions if you have any. But um, here we go. And over to Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Ricardo. So, some lessons about building the cloud. Um, and now, obviously, as operators, we also we don't build the CNFs, but we operate them. And so, some lessons we've learned through launching our 5G services um, include the release cadence. So um, that was mentioned earlier, I think Rook mentioned it. Um, so aligning releases between the community, the platform that we're building, the, the CNF vendors and what they've validated their software against. 
Um, you know, there's a balance between freshness and stability. Um, that's that's been a, a challenge and just something we've had to work through with all the parties. Um, uh, cloud native design patterns is an interesting one. So, um, as Ricardo mentioned, we you know across the markets and across the, the domains we operate in, uh, we've got lots of different vendors, lots of different solutions. Um, we do tend to see. Um, Patterns such as um, you know guaranteed pod sizing um, and large pods still, um, and sort of multiple concerns per pod. Um, it's it's starting to change. We've noticed um, and things like the CNF test suite, the CNF certification program, um, all of those best practices we're trying to build will help um, help towards that. I think. Um, so we can move towards burstable pods and a more kind of flexible um, approach to the networking stack. Um, but also configuration management, lifecycle management. Um, uh, as Ricardo mentioned, it was, you know, it's been months, if not years of design work and, you know, work with the vendors of, and the platform teams and so on uh, to get to launch. Um, and not all of that is about just deploying the day one thing. It's also understanding how do we lifecycle manage the platform um, afterwards um, and lifecycle manage the CNFs. Um, and unfortunately, we're still seeing some legacy element management type approaches, you know, net conf, SSHing, um, that type of thing. Um, and I think that there's a there's a general understanding, I think, that things like the operator approach and um, you know cloud native controller managers for the CNFs is is a good way to go um, and whilst I'm not particularly involved I know Ricardo and some of my colleagues are in Nefio and um, uh, and that's potentially um, bringing some of these new th new thought processes to the to the table as well and so th that's a load of things about the lessons we've learned the problems we've had the challenges we've had um, the things we've faced um, the question is what do we do about it and you know I don't think any of us are uh, arrogant enough to suggest we know the solution, but I think the answer is we all need to work together. Um, as has been mentioned on a few of the talks so far, there's there's a community of operators, of CNF vendors, of cloud vendors, um, platform vendors, and the open source communities themselves. Um, and we can all, I think, um, improve the situations that we mentioned. So, so um, Book mentioned about the collisions earlier on. I think you know we, we recognise all of those. Um, the operators, as was mentioned in the Swisscom talk, you know, there's all the technology in the world can't solve what you know the ways of working that we need to m modernise. Um, and uh, uh, you know, CNF vendors, we need to. You know, work together to modernise the way that the configure the CNFs are lifecycle managed and configured. Um, so we're moving away from the kind of legacy legacy approaches. Um, you know, the communities. Um, I think it's it's quite it's quite easy for us as the operators to sort of sit there and go, well, we need this, we need that. You know, we all need to be part of the communities, like the multi networking KEP, which um, one of my colleagues, Apos, is. Uh, is um, participating in. I know there's a lot of people um, in the room driving that um, and, and I think that that's another good thing to work towards making those multiple interfaces first-class citizens um, as Ricardo said. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of things we can do as a community um, but I think the, the key is that we need to we need to keep working together and keep building that that community to to drive those improvements and build the solutions. Um, and so I've, I've added some links, I know there were some links in some of the earlier presentations as well to the, uh, the multi-networking KEP. Um, for those of you who don't, aren't aware of it, it's, it's a, I'm not fully up to date with it, but I understand it's looking at an improvement to Kubernetes to introduce um, multiple interfaces on pods as a, as a first class citizen rather than uh, something like it is today with Multis, where it requires a, a kind of um, a separate solution to enable. Um, so the CNF Working Group, uh, for those who don't know um, documents, best practices, there's um, a bunch of us organising the community event this afternoon, which I hope to see some of you there, that'd be nice. Uh, CNF Test Suite, 
so that's the, the testing. I think the harness presentation mentioned it as well, which was great. That's what's behind the CNF certification program. Um, Annika, as Ricardo mentioned, has been um, running for a few years now, um, documenting some specifications and you know, it informs and drives our blueprints um, quite heavily. Uh, I mentioned Nefio as a potential future for life cycle management for CNFs. Um, something I haven't mentioned there is silver, um, which is a bit of a mistake. Uh, that's certainly something that is on our radar. Um, I was involved in the early stages, um, but as, a, as an open source community build of a platform, that's an excellent way for us operators to, to kind of contribute back to some of the solutions that are needed to the problems we face. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, we'll do Q&A individually afterwards, I assume. Okay, thanks Tom, thanks okay. Ricardo. Thank you. Um, stay, stay there. Um, first of all, uh, we are running quite ahead of schedule and uh, I got notification that actually uh, it's not only about the people in this room, but the people who would like to come to the particular slot. Uh, so we got the time uh, we're making after this uh, uh, short coffee break. But before we go for the break, I would like to ask uh, uh, Tom and Ricardo. Um, I'm quite intrigued about uh, your experience from the multi-vendor uh, environment. You, I guess, as we all have a multi-vendor CNF uh, setups for our service chains. Uh, what's your experience? Or first question: Did you achieve? Uh, or do you have a multi-tenancy inside a single cluster of the multiple vendors? And the second question is, how do you uh, um, synchronize the upgrade uh, uh, process? It's not only about uh, single CNF and infra to be synchronized, but across the multi-vendors, you have the colorful uh, setup, I guess. So would be interested to, to hear your reflection on that. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll take the brief take it. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. So, um, Yes, so multi-tenancy is, uh, um, let's say, tackled in different ways. Some clusters, we manage to make them multi-tenant, as in multiple applications from the same developer or vendor can coexist. Our requirement for that is that multi-homing, for example, needs to be supported by the application so that uh, um, security, external security devices and external security policies that, apply, that are applied somewhere else outside of the Kubernetes control planes remit, uh, can tell what application is talking to what external system. So that's an absolute mandatory um, requirement. But like you asked, uh, multi-vendor clusters uh, is something we don't do. What we do is to manage the life cycle of Kubernetes clusters so that we can automate the deployment of many dedicated uh, Kubernetes clusters uh, on a single hardware or virtualization platform, depending on whether we do bare metal-based uh, Kubernetes or VM-based Kubernetes. But automating the life cycle of clusters uh, allows us to uh, maintain and uh, manage and upgrade uh, and scale uh, separately, individually, multiple clusters for multiple applications. That's how we separate uh, multiple vendors today. Um, and then, how do we make everybody agree on upgrades? Uh, that's a, actually uh, a mix of stick and carrot. Uh, we are obviously ensuring backward compatibility for all of the management components that we are uh, providing as part of the platform. So we don't, for example, mandate, uh, um, we, we, we support, for example, multiple Kubernetes versions uh, at the same time so that upgrades can be staggered across time if a vendor or if a, if, a, if a solution needs to have more time on an older Kubernetes release, uh, it, provided is among the supported ones, uh, we, prov uh, we, we can do that. And then when the platform upgrades have to come, so Kubernetes releases now are up, um, in the community are every four months, which is good. We have a longer 12 month window for the community support, but obviously as you can imagine, Vodafone goes with commercial distributions of Kubernetes. These have extended support windows, uh, so that allows us to have overlap, overlapping uh, releases uh, that allow us to have uh, uh, yeah, upgrades at different times for different markets and different applications and even different things in the same environment. So um, it's a mix of uh, forcing people to upgrade at our pace 
Um, there's going to be obviously some delay from the community releases to commercial distributions, but the pace has to be the same. We are forcing, telling our vendors, our engineering teams, our operations teams uh, that uh, um, upgrades every, for example, couple of Kubernetes releases, so eight months have to be part of their planning and strategy and uh, mentality going forward, so much more frequently than we did with VNS. And then, um, Backward compatibility, that's a carrot. So we try to obviously not break things. Both in the, have uh, you seen in the architecture here, we have management components, uh, like the Kubernetes control plane and uh, cast manager would be the lifecycle management for Kubernetes clusters. But also we, uh, we are going the etc with the etc architecture for uh, NFV orchestration and the lifecycle management of the network function. So those management components that are also part of the platform uh, those are also part of the upgrades and the life cycle of the overall thing. So it's important that we maintain and don't break anything when, when touching these components. I don't know if you have anything to add or... I think all I'd say is it's a balance because I think that the multi-tenancy within a cluster is kind of, it's seen as a, as a dream, as a goal. But I think that brings an, an awful lot of complexity in that upgrade you know, process as you mean it. And, and having the overhead of some extra control plane nodes to, to ease that part of the complexity is, is, a, is a balance that you know, may be worth having. I think there's a, there is a balance, um, but I think uh, you know, automating the clusters is a huge part of the answer of how we make it as efficient as we can. So you are essentially uh, pushing your pace uh, of uh, upgrades, but allowing uh, the opt out or delay uh, in the comfortable time uh, window exactly. so that everybody can uh, catch up. Exactly. Okay. Yeah.